Welcome to Choice Classic Radio. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and help keep this show alive by donating at choiceclassicradio.com. For more of your favorite old-time radio shows, join us on our companion podcast, Choice Classic Radio Detectives, where we bring to you tales from the greatest detective shows the golden age of radio had to offer. And now... With 526 episodes broadcast from 1941 to 1952, we bring to you The Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host opening the squeaking door for another session of the AGGMS, the Association of Ghouls, Ghosts, and Midnight Spirits. Oh, may I see your membership card as you enter, please? What's that? Oh, no, no, it's not a printed card. All you have to do is show me your wrist. If there's any blood pulsing in your arteries, then you don't belong here tonight. Better come back and try some other time. After you've passed your mortuary tests. <laughs> well, Mr. Host, I'm afraid I don't qualify as a member of your AGGMS, Association of Ghouls, or whatever it is. But I am a charter member of the ILLB Society. The ILLB? What's that, Mary? It's a new one on me. Why, those initials stand for I Like Lipton's Best. To join this club, all you have to do is see that the tea in your teapot is always Lipton's. The club password isn't a word at all. It's that familiar sound of appreciation. Mm -hmm. For really, Lipton tea is delicious, as zestful and spirited as can be. And the reason? Very simple. It's Lipton's brisk flavor. Brisk, you know, is the tea expert's own word for the lively, full-bodied flavor of Lipton tea. That brisk flavor has made a lot of friends, for more folks buy and enjoy Lipton's than any other tea in the world. So try a cup of Lipton tea yourself. I know you'll say, as so many others do, I like Lipton's best. <laughs> And now for tonight's Inner Sanctum Mystery. It's an original radio play by Emil Tepperman, called Make Ready My Grave, and stars two radio favorites, John Banks and Richard Widmark. It's about a boy and a girl who've just been married. A piece of colored string, an open grave, and a hangman's noose. That train is the Southeast Limited. See it? Long, sleek, and powerful. Clicking off the miles and the humming rails. A masterpiece of 20th century mechanical perfection. Nothing about it to suggest lurking hate, or fear, or superstition, or death. But let's take a look into compartment A, car 17. John and Betty Loomis, just married, are going for their honeymoon to John's ancestral estate. John. John, I'm so happy. <laughs> How soon do we get to Loomisville? In about an hour, Betty. Just think, I married into one of the oldest families in the state. I hope you'll be very happy, darling. Oh, I will, I will. You do love me, don't you, John? Of course I do, baby. I'll always love you. Always. No matter what happens. What do you mean, no matter what happens? What could happen? John, something's bothering you. No, no, it's nothing at all. You're hiding something. There's something you haven't told me. It's nothing, Betty. It's nothing to worry about. You don't want to tell me? No, not now. Maybe later. Why are you playing with that piece of yellow string? What? 
You've been playing with it ever since we came onto the train. Hmm. <laughs> Gosh, I... I never noticed. I watched you. You've been tying a knot in it. A knot? Good Lord. I must have tied it without knowing what I was doing. You... You've tied it into a noose. A hangman's noose. But... I don't know how I came to make it or where I picked it up. Well, it, it's only a piece of string. Yes, it's only a piece of string. Betty. What is it, John? Here, take this. A gun? Take it. But why? If, if I should ever try to... If I should ever try to strangle you... John. Please listen to me. If I should ever try to strangle you, promise me to use that gun on me. What are you talking about? Stop. No, this, Stop this is where we can... John, what's this all about? That piece of yellow string and, and now this gun. Put it away, Betty, and remember what I said. Don't ever forget it. Why is it so dark here? This is just a way station. The train only stopped here to let us off. Otherwise, it goes right through. Oh, I thought Loomisville was a big town. Well, it used to be a hundred years ago, but now there's only the Loomis estate. Well, are we far from the estate? About two miles. Old Herman Galt should be here to pick us up in the station wagon. Herman Galt? Mm -hmm. He's the handyman. There's been a Galt working for the Loomis family for the last hundred and fifty years. John, I don't like it here. Dark... That wind. Oh, the devil can Galt be? I wrote them what train we were taking. I'm right, Mr. What... John. Oh, Galt, you frightened my wife. I'm sorry, ma'am, if I scared you. Oh, that that's all right. It it was just the way you spoke so suddenly out of the darkness. If you'll follow me, I've got the station wagon back here. John, he doesn't like me. Galt? No, that's just his way. He's very devoted to the family. Where do you get to know him? I don't think I care to. Johnny, he's driving too fast. It's so dark. Don't worry, Betty. Galt knows this road like the back of his hand. We'll be there in a few minutes. I'm frightened. Darling, please, tell me why you gave me the gun. No, I, I can't tell you now, Betty. Maybe after you meet Uncle Everard. John. What? What's that in your hand? What? Oh. Another piece of string. A red one this time. Oh, I, I... I must have picked it up in here, off the seat. You've knotted it into another hangman's noose. Galt. Yes, Mr. John. This piece of red string, did you put it here? No, sir. Then how did it get here? You ought to know. Yes. Yes, I, I ought to know. Uh, God, why are you stopping here? We're home, ma'am. This is the entrance to the Loomis estate. I've got to get out and open the gate. I'll be right back. Betty, I've, I've got to get out, too. I've got to see for myself. See what, John? You stay here, Betty. But, uh, stay right where you are. Wait a minute. I'm coming, back, too. Betty. Get back in the car. Dr. John is right, ma'am. You shouldn't go with him. Take care of her, Galt. I won't be long. Galt, where is he going? That is the Loomis family cemetery. Cemetery? What does he want to see in there in the middle of the night? He'll tell you himself, ma'am. In due time. No, I'm going to find out right now. Better not, ma'am. Better come John! Back. John, wait for me. Betty, I told you to stay I'm in the going car. with you. I want to know what there is in that cemetery. Get back in that car. I'm your wife now. I have a right to know what this is all about. I'm going with you. All right, if that's the way you feel about it. But hold on to that gun I gave you. Keep it in your hand all the time. John, why? You'll find why? out soon enough. This is the gate of the family cemetery. All the Loomises and their wives are buried here. It's so shadowy. White tombstones look like ghosts. Hold my hand, John. No. Just hold on to that gun. John... Whose grave is this with the high tombstone? My great-grandfather's. Stuart Loomis. 
be found at the Loomis estate. This is my grandfather's grave. His wife. Here's my father. My mother. And... And that's all. That should be all. What do you mean? You come over here. This is what I came to see. This is what I've been afraid of. John. John, it, it's an open grave. Freshly dug. Yes, Betty. It was just dug tonight. But who is it for? Betty, darling. I, uh, I'm afraid it's for you. poor Betty letting herself in for, with a fresh grave waiting for her on a honeymoon, and a husband who ties little strings into hangman's nooses. But you know, come to think of it, Betty's a lucky girl at that. How many girls who get married nowadays can count on finding a nice snug place all ready for them to lie down in and rest in peace? <laughs> Gracious, Mr. Host, Betty doesn't seem like a lucky bride to me. Why, most brides have things much easier. Because there's so many things today to help them make their marriage a success. For example? For example, Lipton tea. With Lipton tea on the pantry shelf, a young bride today has a much better chance of making her home a happy one. Just the other day, I was talking to a friend who just got married. As we sat there in her kitchen, sipping our Lipton tea, me occupying the only chair, and she perched on the kitchen stool, she said... You know, Mary, it was silly of me to worry about being able to cook the things Jack liked. It's not nearly as difficult as I imagined. Take this Lipton tea here. It answers the whole beverage problem as far as Jack is concerned. He's happy as long as he has Lipton's morning, noon, and night. <laughs> well, I told her I could understand that. Because most husbands I know about are partial to Lipton tea. And it's because of the extra satisfaction that's in Lipton's wonderful brisk flavor. Satisfaction, did I say? Mmm, you just try Lipton tea and see if that isn't an understatement. Try Lipton's tomorrow. And now let's hurry back to our date in a graveyard. Remember? With poor Betty, whose husband has just told her he's afraid the freshly dug grave is for her. John, what do you mean? Who dug this grave for me? Who? <laughs> if I told you, you'd think I was crazy. No, you've got to tell me. If I'm in danger, I have a right to know. Was it God? Your Uncle Everard? No. Well, at least I don't think so. His wife, Christine. Betty, do you believe that a... Ghost could dig a grave? Ghost? Do you mean I, I'm in danger from a ghost? Oh, I told you you'd think I was crazy. John, what, why are you looking at me like that? I don't know. Betty, have you got that gun with you? No, I, I left it in the car. What good would a gun be against... A ghost. There's a station wagon still waiting at the gate, but I don't see Galt. Maybe he went up to the house. Galt, where are you? Hello there, John. What? What's up? Uncle Everard. What happened to Galt? He came up to the house. Said you'd gone into the cemetery. So I thought I'd better come down. Oh. Is... Is it there? Yes, it's there. A freshly dug grave. Yeah. Uncle Everard, this is my wife, Betty. Who are you, Betty? Hello. You saw the grave too, Betty? Yes, and, and John says he thinks it's for me. I, I'm afraid I don't understand all this. You haven't this. told her anything yet, John? Well, just, just a, a little. I, I couldn't bring myself to. I think it's time you did. <laughs> What 
tea, Betty? Thank you, Uncle Everard. I will have a little more. You, John? No, thanks. Too bad Christina's ill. She's upstairs in our room. But I hope she'll be better by tomorrow. You can see her then. Maybe. What do you mean? That grave out there. Maybe it'll be filled tomorrow. John, don't you think it's time you kept your promise to tell me what this is all about? You tell her, Uncle Everard. Well, Betty, there's a ghost in the Loomis family. That's it in a nutshell. Oh, I see. And it was a ghost who dug that grave. I know it sounds mad. But after 150 years... We Loomises have come to the conviction that it can't be anything but a ghost. A hundred and fifty years? You mean... John's great-grandfather, Stuart Loomis, settled this strip of seacoast under a patent from the colonial governor. There's his picture over the fireplace. He... He doesn't look much like you, John. Stuart Loomis was a hard man. There was a French privateer in these waters who made a lot of trouble in those days... Gaston Leroux, who sailed the seas with his wife, Antoinette. But what has a French pirate and his wife to do with that grave? Stuart Loomis captured Leroux and his wife, and under the authority conferred upon him by the governor, had the power to hang them. You mean the woman, too? Yes. He hanged them both, on a gibbet where our family cemetery now stands. Oh, how terrible. Before he died... Gaston LaRue laid a curse on the Loomis family. He swore that just as his wife was hanged, so would all the Loomis women die. He swore that he would come back and dig a grave for the wife of a Loomis in every generation and furnish the noose by which a Loomis would strangle his own wife. But, but that's incredible. Short while afterward, a fresh grave was found beside the gibbet where LaRue had been hung. That night... Stuart Loomis' wife, John's great-grandmother, was found hanging by the neck from the eaves of this very house. And Stuart Loomis? I told you Stuart Loomis was a hard man and had made many enemies. There were many who hated him deeply and bitterly. He was arrested and tried for the murder of his wife. Convicted and executed. Now you know the secret of the Loomis family. But, John, that, that still doesn't prove there's a ghost. No, that one incident doesn't prove it. But it happened again when the next Loomis married, John's grandfather. And to the next Loomis, John's father. Sometimes a year after he married, sometimes five years. But the curse never fails. It's happened in every generation? Yes. And now... John Loomis has brought a new wife home. There's a freshly dug grave waiting in the family cemetery. Then... Then I'm next. I don't know, Betty. Maybe that grave isn't for you. What? Maybe it's for Christine. For my wife. This... This is all ridiculous. A ghost couldn't dig a grave, make John strangle me to death. Uncle Everard, you you can't believe such a legend. It can't be true. Maybe not, my dear. But the graves of the strangled Loomis women are out there to prove it. Well, this is your room, Betty. I'll have God call you at eight tomorrow morning. Good night. Good night, Uncle Everard. Good night, John. Good night, Uncle Everard. This is such a big room. It's so gloomy. The whole house is like that. It lies gloomy and sullen under the Loomis curse. Oh, Betty, I love you so much. We'll beat the curse together. Let me go, darling. I want to change my clothes and wash. All right. There's the bathroom over there. I'll only be a minute. All right, darling. 
Oh, it's a lovely bat. <gasps> Betty, what is John, it? John, quick. What? Look. Hanging from the shower bar. What? A hangman's noose. It's a real one this time. Of rope. Ready to hang someone. Who put it there? It's the Loomis curse. We can't get away from it. No ghost could have hung that rope there. Let, let, let's call Uncle Everett. All right. Have you got the gun with you? No, it's in my handbag. Well, get it. But John... Get it, I say. All right, John. Here. Here, I've got it. All right, now, keep it with you all the time. And don't be afraid to use it on me if necessary. All right, let's get your uncle. This is his room. I wonder if I ought to wake him. It might upset Aunt Christine. She's sick. We've got to wake him. A knock harder. Well, it wasn't locked. Call him. Uncle Everard. Uncle Everard? He doesn't answer. But there's a light in the room. Push the door further open. All right. Well, there's nobody in the room. The bed's empty. Uncle Everard? Aunt Christine? Maybe in the bathroom. The door is open. Ah! Betty! John, what is, what? Aunt Christine. She's hanging by the neck. She, she's dead. The same kind of a noose is in our bathroom. Uncle Everard Hanger, it's the Loomis curse catching up with us. Well, Galt, any trace of Uncle Everard? I searched the whole house, basement to attic, not a sign of him. He must have gone out, come along. But it's raining. We've got to find him, Benny, come on. dark out here. How will we ever find you? I have a flashlight, ma'am. You look. What? Fresh footprints in the slush. Oh, they must be Uncle Everard's. They lead down toward the cemetery. Come along, go. Here, Mr. John, you can see for yourself the footprints lead right to this new grave. But why did he come here? There's the answer, Daddy. A cross at the head of the empty grave. Throw your flashlight on it, go. There's something written on it. It says, Christine Lewis. <gasps> Betty, what is it? Look. Over there. Another grave. He's dug another one. There's a cross on this one, too. Does it say anything? Yes. Yes, it does. It says, Betty Loomis. <laughs> John, sit close to me. That portrait of Stuart Loomis over the fireplace looks so real. It frightens me. Now, remember, Betty, whatever happens, hold on to that gun and don't be afraid to use it tonight. Where is Gold? He ought to be here soon. He went to look for some weapons. Here I am, <gasps> what, John. Gold, you always frighten me coming in so quietly. I'm sorry, ma'am. Here, Mr. John, these ought to be pretty good weapons. Size? Yes, I had them sharpened only the other day. They could slice a man's head off in one stroke. Take one, Mr. John. Thanks. But I'd hate to use it on Uncle Everard. If he shows up tonight, you'd better use it. Maybe he's come back into the house through the back way. I'll go through the house again if you'd like. This time I'll start with the attic. Be careful, Galt. I will, Mr. John. John, I don't like him. Galt? And I don't think he likes me either. No, that's that true. Darling, what's that? Must be Galt in the attic. Help, Mr. John! Help! You must have met Uncle Everard hiding up there. Stay right here, Betty, and hold on to that gun. John, be careful. Don't worry, just take care John, of yourself. John, come back. I'm frightened. I'm afraid to be alone. There's, there's nothing to be afraid of. I have this gun. And if anybody comes... I... The lights... Lights went out. Who, who's there? Who's in this room? Don't come any closer. I have a gun and I'll shoot. 
I can't see you, but I'll shoot at the sound. John, help! Rope! Around my neck. Let go, I'll shoot. It's not loaded. I took the bullets out when you left it in the car. Galt? Yes, ma'am, it's Galt. Mr. John is busy up there in the attic with the body of Mr. Everard. I killed him, too. And when Mr. John comes downstairs, he'll find you. And I'll cut him down in the dark with my scythe. Why? Why? There were others besides the pirate LaRue who hated Stuart Loomis. Like my own great-grandfather, he was in the service of Stuart Loomis, and he hated him. When LaRue laid the curse on the Loomises, my great-grandfather decided to make it come true. It was he who strangled the wife of Stuart Loomis. And through the years, the gods from father to son have handed down their hate. You... You're mad. Maybe. I'll tighten the noose and finish Benny, you. where are you? Why is it dark in here? John! Benny! John, look out. It's all he has his eye. And so with I. John! John! Oh! Darling, where are you? Here, John, here. Oh, darling. Betty, we finished forever with the Loomis curse. Well, that was a pretty rough honeymoon for Betty. But, you know, there's a lesson in her story for forgetful wives. Yes, if you keep tying little colored strings to your fingers to remind you of things and you still can't remember them, why not try a rope neatly tied around your neck? It's sure to help you forget. (laughs) Oh, dear, Mr. Host, there you go telling our listeners how to forget things when I've got something for them to remember. Oh, I didn't realize that, Mary. What is it you want them to remember? It's Lipton tea, folks. And you don't need any string tied on your finger or any such reminder. To make sure you get it when you visit your grocers tomorrow, just remember that Lipton's is the tea with the wonderful brisk flavor, the fine quality tea that gives you all the goodness nature meant tea to have. I wish you'd try a cup of Lipton's soon, because it's so delicious. Just ask your grocer for Lipton's. Remember, Lipton's is the tea with brisk flavor. Ah. And so our evening's over. With the usual quota of corpses to qualify for the ghoul school. We're working on a special matriculation for bachelor ghouls. Oh, in case you didn't know, a bachelor ghoul is one who believes that two can die as cheaply as one. (laughs) Oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is I Hate Blondes by Wolf Kaufman. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soups We'll bring you another Inner Sanctum story directed by Hyman Brown and called Dead Man's Turn. It's a, a little night course in murder, that's all. As you have your choice of majoring in choking, shooting, drowning. But uh, why don't you just listen in to Inner Sanctum next week and you'll get all the inside toe. Oh, yes, next week part of the country goes on daylight saving time. If your area remains on standard time, tune in to Inner Sanctum one hour earlier. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams. Want a delicious dinner treat in a hurry? then Lipton's noodle soup mix is the thing for you. In just a few quick minutes, you have a grand-tasting chickeny soup ready to serve. Lipton's noodle soup is full of tender golden noodles and seasoned to perfection. And it's economical, too. Costs less and makes lots more than ordinary canned soups. Just ask your grocer for Lipton's noodle soup mix. Your family will love it. And don't forget to tune in next week 
for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. That concludes today's episode. We'd like to thank you and remind you to donate at choiceclassicradio.com. Remember, your donations make episodes like this possible.